<laughs> Ready or not, here it is. <laughs> so here we are, page 87 of God to Man and Man to God, the Discourses of Mir Baba by uh, yeah. Purdom, Charles Purdom. Uh, uh, Rosalie, would you care to read it for us first? Yeah. Penance, the unwinding of many sanskaras, can be brought about through. Oh. Penance. Oh, that's funny. This, <laughs> <laughs> this consists in augmenting the feeling of remorse when one has done wrong. Repentance consists in mentally reviving the wrongs with severe self-condemnation. It is not mere regret or sorrow for the wrong. Penance is facilitated by remaining vulnerable during periods of emotional outbursts or by deliberate efforts to recall the past with deep disapproval. Such penance unwinds the sanskaras, which are responsible for the action. Self-condemnation, accompanied by deep feeling, can negate the sanskaras of anger, greed, and lust. Sometime or other, a man is bound to experience the reaction of remorse and suffer the pricks of conscience. If at that time, he vividly realizes the evil for which he was responsible, the intensity of emotional awareness by which it is accompanied consumes the tendencies for which he stands self-condemned. Self-condemnation sometimes expresses itself through forms of self-mortification. Some saints inflict wounds on their body when they are in a mood of penitence. But such expressions of remorse are to be discouraged. Some Hindu aspirants cultivate humility by making it a rule to fall at the feet of everyone whom they meet. To a man of strong will and stable character, Penance can bring the desired good effect through any form of self-humiliation, which unwinds the sanskaras connected with good and bad actions. Others, feeble in willpower, derive benefit from penance if they are under sympathetic sympathetic direction. When penance is carefully nourished and practiced, it inevitably results in the psychic revocation of undesirable modes of thought and conduct and brings a man into a life of purity and service. I have to say there was a clap of thunder that here. <laughs> it should, however, be noted that there is always in penance the danger that the mind may dwell too long upon the wrongs done and thus develop a morbid habit of regretfulness and even take pleasure in it. Such sentimentality is a waste of psychic energy and in no way helpful for the wearing out of sanskaras. Penance should not be the everyday regret 
that follows everyday weaknesses. It should not become a sterile habit of immoderate, gloomy pondering over one's failings. Sincere penance does not consist in perpetuating grief or wrongs. One has done, but in resolving to avoid them in future. If it leads to lack of self-respect or self-confidence, it has not served its purpose, which is to render impossible the repetition of certain actions. Withholding desires from fulfillment. The wearing out and the unwinding of sanskaras can also be affected by denying to desires their expression and fulfillment. People differ in their capacity and aptitude for rejecting desires. Those in whom desires arise with strong impulse are often unable to curb them, curb them at their source, but they can refrain from seeking their fulfillment through action. Even if a man has no control over the surging of desires, he can prevent them from being translated into action. Rejection of desires by controlling actions avoids the possibility of sowing the seeds of future desires. I'm repeating that. Rejection of desires by controlling actions avoids the possibility of sowing the seeds of future desires. On the other hand, if a man translates his desires into action, he may exhaust some impressions, but will create fresh impressions, thus sowing seeds for future desires, which in their turn demand satisfaction. The process of speeding up or exhausting impressions through expression and fulfillment does not in itself contribute towards securing release from samskaras. When desires arise and their release into action is barred, there is plenty of opportunity for cogitation upon them. And this cogitation results in the wearing out of the corresponding sanskaras. It should, however, be noted that such spontaneous cogitation does not bring about the desired result if it takes the form of mental indulgence in the thought of, of the desires. Uh, I'm repeating that one. It should, however, be noted that such spontaneous cogitation does not bring about the, de the desired result if it takes the form of mental indulgence in the thought of the desires. When there is an attempt to welcome and harbor the desires, cogitation will not only have no spiritual value, but may be responsible for creating subtle sanskaras. Mental cogitation should not be accompanied by any conscious sanction for the desires which arise in consciousness. And there should be no effort to perpetuate their memory. I'm repeating that one too. Mental cogitation should not be accompanied by any conscious sanction for the desires which arise in consciousness. And there should be no effort to perpetuate their memory. When desires are denied their expression and fulfillment 
in action and are allowed to pass through the intensity of the fire of cogitative consciousness, which does not sanction them, the seeds of these desires get consumed. The rejection of desires and the inhibition of physical response effect in time a negation of past sanskaras. Thanks, Rosalie and Margaret. Um, Marilyn Cedis, uh, could you unmute and continue, please? Guess Marilyn's not at her machine. Marion Lewis. All right. Um, is get my glasses. So go ahead, Marion. I'll, I'll I'll ask you next, Marilyn. Okay. Desirelessness. Rejection of desires is a preparation for desirelessness, or the state of non-wanting which alone brings freedom. Wanting is binding, whether fulfilled or not. When it is fulfilled, it leads to further wanting, and this perpetuates the bondage of the spirit. When unfulfilled, it leads to disappointment and suffering, which through their sanskaras, fetter the spirit. There is no end to wanting because the external and internal stimuli of the mind are constantly alluring it either into wanting or into disliking, which is another form of wanting. The external stimuli are the sensations of sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. The external stimuli arise in the mind from memories of the present life and the totality of sanskaras gathered by consciousness during the evolutionary period in human lives. When the mind is trained to remain unmoved and balanced, in the presence of all external and internal stimuli, it arrives at the state of non-wanting when it is possible to unwind the sanskaras. Wanting is a state of disturbed equilibrium of mind and non-wanting a state of poise. The poise of non-wanting can be maintained only by a disentanglement from all stimuli, whether pleasant or painful, agreeable or disagreeable. To remain unmoved by the joys and sorrows of this world, the mind must be completely detached from external and internal stimuli. Though the mind is constantly fortifying itself through its own constructive activity, there is always the chance of these outposts of defense being washed away by a sudden wave in the ocean of natural mental environment. When this happens, you may for the time feel lost but the attitude of non-attachment keeps you safe. This attitude consists in the application of the principle of denial. Watchful effort is needed to maintain detachment from the opposites of experience. It is not possible to deny only the disagreeable and to remain inwardly attached to those that are agreeable if the mind is to remain unmoved. The equipoise consists 
in meeting both alternatives with detachment. The yes, meaning of the positive sanskaras, can be annulled only through the negative assertion of no, no. This negative element is necessarily present in all aspects of asceticism as expressed through renunciation, solitude, fasting, penance, withholding desires from fulfillment, and non-wanting. The blending of these methods and attitudes creates a healthy form of asceticism. But to ensure this, the negative element must be without any perversions or further limitations. The limit of the negative element. It is useless to try to coerce the mind to a life of asceticism. Any forcible adjustment of life in the ascetic way is likely to stunt the growth of good qualities. When the healthy qualities of human nature are allowed to develop slowly, they unfold knowledge of relative values and thereby pave the way for a spontaneous life of asceticism. But any attempt to force them will invite reaction. The process of being freed from attachments is often accompanied by the formation of some other attachments. The grossest form of attachment is that which is directed towards the world of objects. But when the mind is becoming detached from the world of objects, it has a tendency to arrive at finer attachments of a subjective kind. After the mind has succeeded in cultivating a certain degree of detachment, it may develop that subtle form of egoism, which expresses itself through aloofness and superiority. Detachment should not be allowed to form any nucleus on which the ego may fasten itself. At the same time, it should not be an expression of one's inability to cope with the stress of worldly life. Further, detachment does not consist in clinging to the mere formula of denial, which may become an obsession of the mind without deep felt longing for enlightenment. Such interest in the formula of negation often exists with an inward dwelling on the temptations. The negative sanskaras must also disappear. The negative assertion of no, no is the way of unwinding the positive sanskaras gathered through evolution and human lives. But though this process destroys the positive sanskaras, it results in the formation of negative sanskaras, which also condition the mind and create new problems. The assertion of no, no, has to be sufficiently powerful to affect the eradication of the physical, subtle, and mental sanskaras. But after it has served its purpose, it must be abandoned. Spiritual experience does not consist of negation. 
a negative attitude is equivalent to an intellectual concept used to condition the mind, but it must be renounced. Thought has sometimes to be used to overcome limitations set up by its own movement. But when this has been done, it has itself to be given up. This is the process of going beyond the mind, which becomes possible through non-identification with the mind and its desires. To look upon the body as well as all thoughts and impulses objectively is to get established in detachment and to negate the sanskaras. This means freeing the soul from its self-imposed illusions such as, I am the body, I am the mind, or I am desire, and gaining ground towards the enlightened state of, I am God, Anil Hag, or Aham Brahmasmi. Thanks, Marion. Marilyn, you ready? Okay. <sighs> Exhaustion of sanskaras. Those methods of removing sanskaras that have been explained depend chiefly on the principle of negating those positive sanskaras that veil the truth from consciousness and prevent self-illumination. These methods are based upon the control of the body and mind. The control of the habitual tendencies of the mind is much more difficult then the control of physical actions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Fleeting and evasive thoughts can be curbed only with great patience and persistent practice. But the restraint of mental processes and reactions is necessary to check the formation of new sanskaras and to wear out or unwind the old. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> Control is a conscious activity and involves effort as long as the mind attempts to recondition itself through the removal of sanskaras. But after release from the sanskaras, the activity is spontaneous because the mind is functioning in freedom. Such control is born of strength of character and health of mind and brings with it immense peace. The mind which appears feeble when uncontrolled becomes a source of great strength when controlled. Control is indispensable for the conservation of the psychic energy and the economical use of thoughtful, of thought force for creative purposes. If, however, control becomes mechanical, it defeats its own purpose, which is to make possible the free and unconditioned functioning of the mind. The control that has spiritual value does not consist in the repression of thoughts and desires, but is the restraint exercised by the perception of positive values discovered 
during experience. Control is essentially therefore not merely negative. When positive values enter consciousness, they generate psychic energy, which removes the mental tendencies that interfere with free expression. Thus, the tendencies towards lust, greed, and anger are removed through the recognition of the value of a life of purity, generosity, and kindness. Continue. Yes, please. The mind that is accustomed to certain habits of thought and responses does not find it easy to adjust itself to these new results of its own perceptions owing to the inertia caused by the impression impressions of previous modes of thought and conduct. And this process of readjustment in the light of true values is what we call controlling the mind. But this control is never mechanical. It is an effort of the mind to overcome its own inertia. It is fundamentally creative. Dispersion through sublimation. Creative control is possible because the source of light is within and though self-illumination is prevented, by the veil of sanskaras, there is not, even within the boundaries of ordinary human consciousness, complete darkness. The ray of light which leads the individual onward is the sense of true values which guides with varying degrees of clarity according to the thickness of the veil of sanskaras. The process of, repla of the replacing lower by higher values is the process of sublimation, which consists in diverting the psychic energy locked up in sanskaras toward creative, spirit and spiritual ends. When the psychic energy is thus diverted, those sanskaras get dispersed. Jay Baba. The method of sublimation has the special advantage of having an unfailing interest for We've lost you, Marilyn. Uh, I wonder if we could have a, a, a new re another reader. Anne Elizabeth, are you at your machine? How about Mahu? Yes. One second, let me, yes. Okay. Mahu, you're, you're uh, muted. I'm back. Yeah. Oh, 
going to call in because I got disconnected or somehow the thunder created some kind of a, a disruption here. How do you like that? Did someone else, is someone else reading now? Yes, yes, thank you very much, Marilyn. Beautiful reading. Oh, uh, Mahu, Jay go Baba. ahead. Jay Baba, thank you. Jay Baba. Baba the method, yes, the method of sublimation has the special advantage of having an unfailing interest for the aspirants at all stages. There's a black box. There's a black here. box covering the yeah. wall. One second. Uh, oh, one second. Uh, no. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Uh, could you start again, please, love? Thanks. The method of sublimation has the special advantage of having an unfailing interest for the aspirant at all stages. The method of negation without substitution though necessary, is likely to be boring and may seem to lead to vacuity. But the method of sublimation is at every stage of absorbing interest, bringing an ever-increasing sense of fulfillment. Psychic energy can be sublimated into spiritual channels through one, meditation, two, selfless service of humanity, and three, devotion. Meditation is deep and constant concentration upon an ideal object, and its nature and forms will be dealt with in the next discourse. Selfless service. While meditation on the personal and impersonal aspects of God requires withdrawal of consciousness into the sanctuary of one's own heart, concentration on the universal aspect of God is best achieved through the selfless service of humanity. When the mind is absorbed in the service of humanity, it is oblivious of its body and mind and their functions as in meditation, and therefore new sanskaras are not formed. Further, the old sanskaras which bind the mind are shattered and disposed. Since the mind is now centering its attention, not upon its own good, but upon the good of, upon the good of others, the nucleus of the ego is deprived of its energy. Selfless service is therefore one of the best methods of sublimating the energy locked up in the binding sanskaras. Selfless service is accomplished when there is no thought of reward or result as an earlier discourse has made clear. You are willing to sacrifice everything for the well-being of others. Their comfort is your convenience, their health your delight, and their happiness your joy. You find your life in losing it in theirs. You live in their hearts, and your heart becomes their shelter. Thus, through living for others, your own life finds its expansion. The person who leads a life of selfless service is, however, never self-conscious in serving. He does not make those he serves feel that they are under any obligation to him. 
Jai Baba. The purifying, the purifying effic efficacy of love. Love comprehends the different advantages belonging to the other paths leading to emancipation and is the most effective path. It is characterized by self-sacrifice and happiness. Its uniqueness lies in the fact that in wholehearted offering to the beloved, there is no di diversion of psychic energy and concentration is complete. In love, the physical, vital and mental energies are made available for the cause of the beloved and become dynamic power. The tension of true love is so great that any feeling which might intervene is at once eliminated. Thus, there is no parallel to the expulsive and purifying efficacy of love. There is nothing artificial about it, for love subsists from the beginning of evolution. At the, organic, at the organic stage, it is expressed in the form of coercion or attraction. It is the natural affinity that keeps things together and draws them to each other. The gravitational pull exercised by the heavenly bodies upon each other is an expression of love. At the, organic, at the organic stage, love becomes self-illumined and self-appreciated, even from the amoeba to the most evolved human beings. When love is self-illuminated, its value is conscious sacrifice. The sacrifice of love is complete and ungrudging. The more it gives, the more it wants to give, and the less it is conscious of having given, given. Ever increasing and never failing, it seeks to please the beloved. It welcomes suffering to satisfy a single wish of the beloved or to relieve the beloved of the slightest neglect. It would gladly die for the beloved. The lover breaks through his limitations and loses himself in the being of the beloved. Such deep and intense love is called bhakti or devotion. In its initial stages, devotion is expressed through worship, through ritual before the de deities and reverence to the revealed scriptures or through the pursuit of the highest in abstract thinking. In its more advanced stages, devotion expresses itself in the form of interest in human welfare and the service of humanity, love and the reverence for saints and allegiance and obedience to the spiritual master. These stages have their relative values and relative results. Love for a living master is a unique stage in devotion, for it gets transformed into parabhakti or divine love. Parabhakti. Parabhakti is not merely intensified bhakti. 
It begins where bhakti ends. At this stage of para bhakti, devotion is not only single minded, but is accomplished, I'm sorry, is accompanied by extreme restlessness of the heart and the ceaseless longing to unite with the beloved. This is followed by lack of interest is in one's own body and its care, isolation from one's own surroundings and utter disregard for appearances or criticism while the divine impulses of attraction to the beloved become more frequent. This highest phase of love is love incarnate, a ride who can, as the Supreme Beloved, responds to the lover most completely. The purity, sweetness, and efficacy of the love which the lover receives from the master contributes to the insight insuperable spiritual value of this highest phase of love. Uh, thank you, Mahu. Um, Mayor Duval Garubala, are you ready to read, Mayor? Mayor might not be at her machine. Back to Anne Elizabeth, are you at your machine? Sure. Meditation. The nature of meditation and its conditions. Meditation may be described as the path that the individual makes for himself while trying to get beyond the limitations of the mind. The man who finds himself drawn into deep meditation is grappling with spiritual problems. Meditation has been misunderstood as a process of forcing the mind upon a selected idea or object. Most people naturally have an aversion to meditation because they experience difficulty in attempts to coerce the mind in a particular direction or to pin it down to one particular thing. Any purely mechanical use of the mind is bound to be spiritually unsuccessful. The first principle for aspirants to remember is that the mind can be controlled and directed in meditation only according to the laws inherent in the makeup of the mind itself and not by means of the application of force. Many persons who do not technically meditate are often found to be deeply and intensely engrossed in systematic and clear thinking about some practical problem or theoretical subject. This mental process is very similar to meditation in as much as the mind is concentrated upon the one subject to the exclusion of all others. Meditation is spontaneous in such mental processes because the mind is dwelling upon an object in which it is interested and increasingly understands. The object of meditation has always to be carefully selected and must be spiritually important. It should be some divine person or object or some spiritually significant theme or truth. To attain success in meditation, the mind must not only be interested in the divine subjects, but must understand and appreciate them. Some intelligent meditation is a natural process of the mind. And since it avoids the rigidity and regularity of mechanical meditation, it is easy and successful. 
Meditation and Concentration. Meditation should be distinguished from concentration. It is the first stage of a process which develops into concentration. In concentration, the mind seeks to unite with its object by the process of fixing itself upon it, whereas meditation consists in thinking about a particular object to the exclusion of other things. In concentration, there is practically no movement of the mind. In meditation, the mind moves from one relevant idea to another. In concentration, the mind dwells upon an idea without amplify, amplifying it or connecting it with other ideas. In meditation, the mind assimilates the object by dwelling upon its attributes or implications. In concentration, as in meditation, there is the intermingling of love and longing for the divine object. Persons who have not the capacity of intense con concentration have to begin with meditation. Whereas those who have the capacity for concentration find meditation unnecessary. The latter may immediately concentrate on the form of a God man or some such formula as I am neither the material body nor the subtle body nor the mental body. I am Atman. Silence and seclusion. Meditation is essentially an individual matter in the sense that it is not for society, but for one's own spiritual advancement. Isolation of the individual from societal, from social surroundings is almost always necessary in meditation. The ancient yogis took to the mountains and caves in search of seclusion. Undisturbed silence is necessary. However, there is no need to go to mountains and caves in search of these conditions, for even in towns, the quiet, silence, and seclusion necessary for meditation can be found. Darkness. Darkness or the closing of eyes is not necessary for meditation. If the aspirant mentally faces the object of meditation, he may have successful meditation even with open eyes. But generally, he will find that to get away from physical sights and sounds is helpful. To secure complete silence involves careful selection of the spot for meditation. But one has only to close one, one's eyes to protect the mind from the disturbance of sights. Sometimes when there is light, closing the eyes is not sufficient to ward off visual stimulation. It is then advisable to meditate in darkness. Darkness normally promotes progress in meditation. Posture, place, and hour. As to posture, there are no fixed rules. Any posture that is comfortable and hygienically unobjectable, unobjectionable may be adopted, so long as it does not induce sleep and contributes to the alertness of mind. The posture should not involve physical tension or strain because it then invites the attention of the mind. The body should therefore be relaxed, but the usual position taken in sleep should be avoided because it may induce sleep. When the body has assumed a convenient and suitable posture, it is helpful to think of the head as the center of the body when it becomes easier to withdraw one's attention from the body and to fix it on the object of meditation. 
I'm going to reread that last sentence. When the body has assumed a convenient and suitable posture, it is helpful to think of the head as the center of the body when it becomes easier to withdraw one's attention from the body and to fix it on the object of meditation. It is desirable that the aspirant should maintain the same posture for each meditation. The associations that the posture has with meditation endow it with the capacity to induce meditation. When the body has assumed the chosen posture, it is under the subconscious suggestion that it must serve the purpose of meditation. Choosing the same spot and a fixed hour are also useful because of association. Hence, the aspirant should adopt the same place, posture, and hour. The choice of place involves consideration of its occult associations. Special importance is attached to meditating in holy places where the masters have lived or meditated. The posture, place, and hour of meditation have an importance that varies according to the individual. The master, therefore, may give different instructions to disciples. However, where meditation has become habitual through practice, adherence to a fixed place, posture, or time can be dispensed with, and the aspirant can meditate under any conditions. Even when walking, he may be absorbed in meditation. Beautiful. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Mayor Daruvala, are you back at your machine yet? You have to unmute if you are. Okay. Jay, I, uh, I assume you are busy with uh, child care. If you're not, unmute. Yeah, sorry, I can't read. Oh, no problem, Jay. Okay, I'll take a turn then. A joyous act. Meditation should not be resorted to as if it were a form of medicine. One has to be serious, but this does not mean that the aspirant must look grave or melancholy. Humor and cheerfulness not only do not interfere with the progress of meditation, but contribute to it. Whoops. Meditation should not be turned into a distasteful or tiresome thing. The aspirant should freely allow himself the joy attendant upon successful meditation without getting addicted to it. All thoughts of depression, fear, or worry should be eliminated. Collective meditation. Though meditation is essentially an individual matter, collective meditation has advantages. When aspirants who are in harmony with each other meditate together, their thoughts have a tendency to augment and strengthen each other. This is particularly noticeable when the disciples of the same master are collectively engaged in meditation upon their master. But if the collective meditation is to yield its full advantages, each aspirant must be concerned with the course of his own meditation and not with what others are doing. Though in the company of others, he has to be oblivious of the world, including his body, and to be exclusively cognizant of the object agreed upon before the beginning of the meditation. Intelligently conducted, collect collective meditation can prove to be 
of immense help to beginners. Although advanced aspirants invariably meditate by themselves. Uh, subtitle of Disturbing Thoughts. In ordinary thinking, the flow of trains of thought is common. But when the mind sets itself to meditation, there is usually a tendency towards irrelevant thoughts. This is a habit of the mind, and the aspirant should not be disturbed by the appearance of contrary thoughts, which had hitherto not made their appearance. Meditation includes bringing the subconscious contents of the mind to the forefront of consciousness. The aspirant must be prepared for disturbing thoughts and should exercise patience with the confidence that these disturbances will be overcome. The last but not least important condition of attaining success in meditation is to adopt the right technique in respect of disturbing thoughts. It is useless to waste psychic energy by direct effort to repress them. Such an attempt leads to further attention to the disturbing thoughts, which feed upon the attention given to them and get strengthened. It is better to ignore them and return to the object of meditation without attaching undue importance to disturbing factors. By recognizing the irrelevance of disturbing thoughts, it becomes possible to let them die through neglect keeping the mind upon the object of meditation. And here's a good place to stop. Um, and we'll, we'll pick up again next week uh, here, page 100.